didn't realize that like some of these big box mainstream stores, they're not reselling the items you return. Like 30 to 40% of returns are not being resold. Welcome to the GOAT Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Casino. At GOAT, we define sustainability through the lens of intentionality, circularity, and community. With this framework, any problem can be solved. The stories that we share, the pioneers that we talk to, show us a different way to build the future we all want to have. We're at a pivotal moment where nuclear is needed more than ever. Let's once and for all become a circular economy. Waste is not cost neutral. Like it always costs your business something. So if you can get rid of that, then that's good for business as well. There's this dissonance. We talk a really good game about protecting the ocean, but the purchase decisions that we make don't match with our espoused values. An ideal food system revolves around relationship. Where is my food coming from? Who's growing it? How is it being grown? And why does that matter? Thanks for being here. Let's dive into the conversation. I think that this is going to be a really fun podcast just because I think it's such an interesting angle on kind of how, I don't know, our approach at GOAT on sustainability is is very different from a lot because it's more of like that practical side of like what really can you do as an everyday person trying to make your way in the world, make sense of everything because there's always these huge problems in sustainability. It's like it, it almost feels insurmountable. And so what I love about what you guys are doing at Hand Me Up is like this idea of like it doesn't have to be crazy complicated, but it still can make a huge impact. But I would love to start with just, I mean, I, there's a little bit of your story, I mean, obviously on the site and everything, but tell me a little bit about the beginning. So I run Hand Me Up with my best friend, Nicole. We've been friends since we were like 14. And um, we were doing a podcast and blog just for moms. And so we really had like a, a pulse on what moms were going through. And meanwhile, Nicole kind of goes down this whole path of ethical fashion, which is essentially realizing that the clothes that are being made are not being made in an ethical way necessarily. And it kind of sent her on this tailspin about just the clothes she was wearing, where they were coming from, what that actually looked like. And we knew we wanted to leave kind of like the influencer world and do something that was more impactful. We just didn't know what it was yet. And so those just kind of like converged um, to me, like laying in bed one morning and was like, it would be so easy if we could do something like Stitch Fix, but with secondhand clothes that we keep in circulation. And so that's that's kind of how I was born. The fashion industry has been something that we... We've talked about a little bit, um, but we are, I want to say we tread lightly on it because it's, it's so complex. Like there are so many moving parts to ethical fashion and fast fashion. And I mean, there, it, there are so many things involved. It's from water to dyes, to shipping, to materials, to human labor, and then distribution, life cycle, uh, everything, which is, it's kind of overwhelming when you try to take it on. What was kind of the first step for you guys where you're like, okay, here's what we can do. And then here's where we're going to start. So as like first time business owners, a lot of that was like, yeah, here's this huge problem. But like, what can we actually do as far as opening a business goes that can change and can make a change? And, you know, as much as we would have loved to start a clothing line out of like recyclable fashion, um, fabric, we didn't know anything about any of that. Like, so we had to kind of bite off what we could chew, so to speak. Like you're saying, it's a huge, and even as we got into it more, I mean, we didn't know how much of a huge issue it was when we started. I think what we were really interested in in the beginning was the labor that was going into making clothes. And it's specifically that so many moms are the ones making the clothes, that women are the ones doing it. And a lot of times their kids are like just working alongside of them. That was what really, I guess, kind of got our hearts to get going on it. Yeah. 
No, we were looking at uh, like a whole nother business idea altogether that wasn't even in this industry and just like completely pivoted when we had this idea. Um, so, so no, we weren't, I think now we do want to chase down some of these bigger problems, harder to solve problems, I think, um, more to speak, but like at the beginning we weren't, we weren't aware until we like started getting our hands dirty of what a big problem it was. So what was that process like when you guys did kind of start going in? What was it like kind of the learning process? And I mean, first time business owners too, it's like kind of a lot. It is. I mean, and, and like we're moms um, and like, that's our priority is to be a, a good mom. So juggling that with a business is that has been probably the hardest thing is you have this dream and this problem you're trying to solve but you also like really want to be in the carpool line every single day to pick up your kids like that's what you shine that's what you really want to do so it has been a lot to juggle but at the beginning we already had a community of moms because of that podcast and so we really just talked to them a lot because for us we knew the business couldn't be successful if it wasn't as simple as buy and click Amazon was like we, we needed to compete at a level that um, was as inexpensive and as easy as some of these big box stores or people weren't going to change their behavior to come back from us. And the ultimate goal, obviously, as a business owner is to sell. But like we were trying to change behavior from what people were doing. I mean, our hope is if we can introduce people to secondhand shopping and getting more comfortable with it. I mean, moms run the family. They run the household. Like if, if they start buying secondhand for their kids and they're going to start buying secondhand for themselves. And before you know it, the husband starts getting secondhand stuff and everybody's starting to think about their clothes more. Um, so that was kind of where we started with it all. I mean, from the secondhand side of things and even just, I don't know, children's clothing, they grow so quickly. And so you, I almost feel like as if you were buying new and which most moms do, or families do it's it's always like new it's very expensive like i think that's one of like the biggest things it's like why the market almost like captures you to have to spend a lot Mm -hmm. yes yes which is great for us too as far as our business model goes but i think too a lot what we see with kid clothes too is they're trying to keep the cost down. So they're buying a lot of polyester and inexpensive fabrics, which I really just like perpetuates this problem like crazy. Um, And then to your point, they're growing fast. So, I mean, we do have a harder time stocking boys clothes because they just are so much harder on their clothes than girls are. And I think moms love to buy girl clothes because we, I mean, the amount of stuff we get that's never been worn that has tags on it is still, is just crazy. It really is crazy. Talk a little bit about the impact of, of really like the material side of things too. I mean, all that polyester, if you think about it, like. It makes sense as a material from the standpoint of kids get messy, they get dirty, polyester cleans a little bit better than cotton and all those things. But what's the, I mean, there's obviously a problem there, but what was that like kind of tackling that for you guys? Well, I mean, when I, when we started Hand Me Up, we didn't know anything about polyester. (laughs) I mean, like we, you know, we, we knew kids clothes, but it wasn't, I, I knew brands and stuff, but I didn't know like, oh this is literally plastic. Like this is never going to break down. And it is, the more we've dug into that, the more it's like, oh, wow. Like, yeah, if we end of life a polyester piece in our business, that is, it's not going anywhere. It's not breaking down. There's nothing. And the, and there really isn't, there's, you know, a few places around the world that are trying, but there really isn't like a path for polyester right now, other than to just, sit in a landfill like a water bottle would Mm -hmm. so walk me through the business model of kind of give me the hand me up pitch if you will of what you guys actually actually do kind of at scale and where you guys are kind of looking to you know really disrupt everything yes um so our our product is a we call it the bag 
It's seven items of kids' clothing, so three tops, three bottoms, and one bonus item, like a dress or a vest or something. We kind of want them all to go together so that they can be mix and match and make it really simple for mom to be like, go get dressed, and everything matches back in their bedroom. Um, we're doing it in the sizes kind of that you mentioned, the uh, birth to six, that hyper growth where they're turning over really fast and um, and yeah, needing new clothes all the time. You can pick seasons. We have a style profile so we can get you kind of exactly what you want. So that's what we're selling. As we've grown, we've realized that there's a lot of like add-on pieces that are like so crazy. There's so much of them in circulation, like an Easter dress. That's something that a kid wears one time. You wouldn't believe how many beautiful Easter dresses we get. And so now you can add on things to your order to um, kind of help. It really was out of a place of, we don't want to throw this inventory. Like we don't want to send this out back into the world. We want to use it. So now you can, yeah, add on things. And Essentially, I mean, for us, the main goal is really to teach parents how to think about consuming less, um, how how to buy consciously, and how to reuse kind of what we already have as a society here. And and as we grow, I think we have so many ideas of other ways to solve that and other ways to use fabrics and textiles and things. So it's it we're right on the cusp, I think of of getting to tackle some of those problems too, which we're all really excited about. How do you collect everything? Cause I, I, I just think about like this pile of clothing, like you got to sort through it and then be like, well, this is perfect for this. Like, how do you guys do that side of things? Cause that's to me, that's like the crazy squeeze of the business, if you will. Um, yes. And that is what most people, uh, like, uh, business people ask us, uh, it's very hand heavy. Yes. It's very hand heavy. And the, the second hand industry is in general. So any other, like of these companies that are doing things like this, it's, it is, uh, someone's touching it. Someone's looking at it. We're actually washing everything too. So, um, so yeah, all, all of that does happen. The cool thing in what, I would say is a like heart passion of mine is because of the flexibility of our like business model and not needing like the inventory being so much moms can work whenever they have time. So as far as like employing people, like we love the idea of employing moms to come and sort and why, and who knows kids clothes better than moms and who knows laundry better than moms, like <laughs> so to come and they, and it just provides a way for them to have a career, which is something I felt like I couldn't do. I couldn't have a career and be the type of mom that I wanted to be. And so as we grow, we would love to employ more, um, more moms to come help sort and do things like that but yes it is just huge piles of clothes everywhere (laughs) was that a was that kind of a hard transition going to be like yeah i can do this like i can be a mom and i can run a company because i i do think there's a certain side of like one it's time management for sure but like moms are good at time management and the other side is like you know there's a nut when do you take time for yourself you know i think that that's like one of the one of the challenges especially as like a mom you're like okay cool kids to bed. Okay. Time for myself. But now you're diving into a business. So, so what, what was that like for you personally to like take that on? Oh, it is, it is, um, a daily like challenge that if I'm not having it, my co-founder Nicole is like one or the other of us is constantly in my kid has a play this week and I need to be available more for them. Or I really want to go on this field trip and, and, and yeah, mom guilt is real. Like I'm missing this to do this or, or whatever. It is not, it is not easy, but we do joke that hand me up is actually like self-care for us. <laughs> Which It's probably totally unhealthy after listening to you ask the question, but it, I mean, that's what I did last night. The kids went to bed and I sat on my computer and it felt good to like exercise my brain and, you know, try to solve some problems for our business. And so there is a little bit of like self-care sometimes as a mom when you're just all day 
I mean, I colored coloring sheets. I held a baby all day yesterday. So by by the end of the day, I was like, oh, I kind of want to do something that's a little bit using more of that executive side of the brain. Yeah. Well, and I, I think that's a really cool way to put it too, because it's, it is a balance. I, I think when you find something that you enjoy or that you're passionate about, that you believe in, like work as it is, um, it's, it's kind of, it's what you want to put your life into and whatever that is. Um, and, and that's where I find it a really cool opportunity. What was, in terms of like the feedback from moms initially, what was that like when you guys launched and started kind of going here, let's, let's get this going, the shipping, I mean, everything, what was kind of the response from moms and getting people on board? Cause obviously like a lot of this is education. It's like, no, you, you, there is another way. Like, so I would imagine there's one side of like, you have to get all the clothing, sort the clothing, ship the clothing, package the clothing, do the website, all that stuff. But then you also have to do the other side of like, why does it actually matter? Like, if it's ballpark ish the same price, well, I'm already at Target, so why not? It's interesting because so like our return customer rate for the first quarter of this year was 90%. So like people, once they're buying from us, they are definitely coming back. Our return rate is like right around 1%. Like people are happy with the product. Yes, yes. But we are having a hard time selling on mainstream apps like Instagram and Facebook from like an advertising perspective. And I think it's exactly to your point is it it does take an education lead and there's nobody really doing it. Um, Like Stitch Fix is kind of the concept, but you can only buy certain, you know, you have to pay for the things after you get, like it's not the same thing, like a bag of clothes. Like people are very used to buying one item, one shirt for this much money. And and not so much, but like a lot of the problems we thought we would have aren't really problems. Like we thought people would really care what items they got. And actually, no, I mean, moms are so tired. I think of making decisions that they're perfectly fine to, you know, give us some like just bumpers and let us put together something from it. I mean, it, it shows in our return rate, like they're not disappointed with, um, what they're getting. So it has been, it, it is very, we are finding it is very education heavy. And honestly, to your point earlier in the podcast about just the problem is so big. I, we haven't exactly figured out like a concise way that is working to sell that up against like some of these mainstream brands on online. If that makes sense. Yeah. And what I'd imagine you also have a lot of, I mean, just in the ad space, whether Instagram, Facebook, your your ad spend is against all the other companies that are spending on <laughs> the exact same thing, usually with bigger budgets. So you have like that side, but then yeah, the edgy I mean, the satisfaction rate, that's insane. Like that's that's incredible. And it is, I mean, as and it it just keeps going up. And so it is very I mean, we're excited about it. It's exciting as a business owner, but it's also like we do need to fill the front end of the funnel with new customers faster. And it is, it isn't, it isn't like, it isn't translating in a 10 second video on a Facebook ad. We're having a very hard time with that. If that makes sense. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would imagine just with the satisfaction rate being so high that it's like, Hey, bumpers do this. Was that kind of the idea around that? Was that, kind of just reflecting on what you guys would do. It's like, well, at this point, as long as it looks pretty solid, we're good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the huge, you know, you were saying secondhand, it seems so like so many people have to actually have their hands on the items. One of the huge things with like some of these bigger sites, like thread up and stuff is they're photographing every single item. And so the idea was we don't want to do that. We don't like imagine the time suck that that is. And we could save by not doing that and just giving like a general concept. And it's evolved over time. Like people, we just redid our sto- uh, our style profile to be even more detailed so that moms can say like, she loves unicorns or whatever. So we can get, because because and in, in a lot of that comes out of mom's feedback, but also like from an inventory perspective, we were getting so many unicorn shirts, for example, it's like, 
I don't want to just send those back out into the world. I want to use them, but I have no way of knowing if a little girl loves unicorns or not. So like if a mom will let me know that she loves unicorns, then I have a way to kind of offload that inventory and get it back into someone else's hands to use, if that makes sense. I'd imagine you guys see the trends too. Like, oh, it's unicorn time. It's goat time. It's, you know, whatever going through. It's like, I would imagine. Yeah, literally. (laughs) Yes, they have a series on Instagram that um, Nicole started. It's called Unhinged Kids Clothes. And it's like, we just get the, I mean, you would be shocked at the stuff that they try to put on kids. Like, we just got this week, it was like a bug shirt and it had all these bugs on them. And and they're all named. And one of them is Wingman. Like, all the bugs are like, I'm like, who puts their kids in this? I mean, like I do. I'm not saying like, but it's just like, why does Target think we want like a shark on a skateboard, like eating a snow cone? Like, why do they think that's what we want? Like, stop buying this stuff. I don't understand why they think we want this. It's because we're buying it. Like, stop. <laughs> it's crazy. Well, and I, I think that that speaks to like kind of a bigger thing in fashion just in general it's this this idea of like well if you feed it and advertise enough and get the right people to wear it it, it'll take off but is that is that what we need and i think that's like the biggest thing yes i know no we we joke on instagram all the time like holidays are another huge like niche clothing item that people buy a ton of and honestly I would blame grandparents the most here from what we hear from our customers but it's like you guys stop buying like chicks dig me with a like an easter chick on it for like you know and because that's even more niche that's like one one week if you're lucky really one day that that can be worn and so we're sitting over here trying to figure out like how do we reuse this stuff and you know this is so ugly quite weakly. like how do we reuse it what do we do with this what can how can we reuse this fabric how can we yeah it is it's very interesting do you think some of the secret to, I don't know, I, I think you have such a difference in children's clothing versus adult clothing. And I don't want to say let's make children's clothing a bit more adult, but we, I don't think we would wear a chick's dig me with a, you know, just on Easter, you know? So it's like, is that, is that part of it? I don't know what it is about kids, like the things that, yeah, people think like even like just the characters, you know, like the amount of like Disney princess stuff. And like my kids want to wear that stuff. It's not just me being like, you should wear this. Like they they get very into Paw Patrol and want to wear Paw Patrol shirts. And I guess it's kind of like a grown man, like wanting to wear his sports team, kind of, so to speak. But it's just like, Yes, we we try our best in the bag specifically to just include basics. So solid colored shirts, striped shirts, you know, really more basic items that can be worn with, you know, the three other pairs of shorts that are coming in the bag. But then it does still leave this problem of we have all these items that we still want to sell or, you know, move to another family to use. Um, And so we tried different things over the years. And I think we're getting better at moving, you know, more specific items. Mm hmm. Is there like a a line kind of where I don't know if if the clothing's too used, torn? Like, wh- what do you kind of do with that topic? Because I know, like, a lot of times in the in the secondhand market, some people would be like, "Well, it's kind of an easy way just to get rid of it, right? Like, I don't have to put it in the garbage, but I can just donate it, even if it's in horrible condition, and be like." Oh, I donated. Yes. Trash. Like how does that trash. work? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. People, um, we, yeah, people donate trash a lot. Um, so I mean, right now we just have hired someone new and she can sew. So, which is really exciting for us. So in, We've been trying to find really creative ways. I mean, also with kids' clothes, not just full stains are a lot more prevalent with kids' clothes than, yeah, <laughs> than even adults' clothes, I'm sure. Um, you know, what patches she can do. She Like, we've tried embroidery over, like, a stain, um, trying to figure out. But even then, from our perspective, is like, 
if this is a really cheap polyester, is it worth the effort of saving it? Whereas, you know, like denim, for example, that's so resilient. It's like, this is worth finding a way to um, patch this up or whatever. So as we grow and as the years goes on, like that is definitely something we're trying to figure out is where that line is. And it's interesting since we hired her, like trying to explain that line to her, like we kind of innately know what works for our business right now. But, and, and I'm like, I don't know how to describe sometimes to her, like, no, that fabric is like, it's, it's too far gone already. Um, but like we try, we're trying our, like Nicole just found this laundry detergent that's supposed to revitalize worn down fabric. So like we are always trying to solve the problem because there is so much stuff and we, you know, it's being shipped to us in some cases. And so like, we don't want to not use it after we've spent the time getting it from shipping. So, so it is a problem. We are always, looking to solve and as we grow and, you know, do more volume and have more financial like options for us, we can change that as time goes on. Yeah. Cause I think the life cycle of clothing, that's, that's the key. I mean, I, I, I don't want to say I started to understand the luxury market better in the, in the past year or so, or at least diving into fashion a little bit more, but it's like, yeah, that thing may be for adult side, at least that thing may be more expensive, but it, it will last and therefore and and you care for it because you you were like wow i spent a lot of money on that so you actually might take care of it more and then it doesn't actually go to waste you have to buy the new thing where's the line in fashion though like because i feel like it used to be oh you had your yearly thing and then it was your seasonal thing and then it was your monthly thing yeah, and now it's almost season. your weekly thing yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and so how do you combat that specifically on the on the children's side because yeah part of its basics and stuff like that but is it is it the education side on that or do you find the actual market might start to just turn more to that because are people tired of always changing their wardrobe every week for example yes i mean i do think that there are data that indicates that the market is turning i mean just the increase in secondhand purchasing is crazy so i do i do see that i mean we talk a lot about di- buying for durability on on our like social channels and stuff but the truth is is like you said like some people don't have the financial option and so many people now are conditioned to being able to get a t-shirt for $5 at target and so it's like it is it is a hard sell to convince somebody to go buy, you know, a real cotton T-shirt for their kid that's going to cost $20 more than it has to be a conviction, which we do see. I mean, that people are convicted and want to buy certain brands because they know they're treating the earth well. But that's where I think, yeah, education, I don't think we realized how big of a hill to climb that would be when we started hand me up for sure. Just educating people about it. And that is one of the reasons why we've said we have to keep the price point low and it has to be easy to do because if we can't compete there, then it's going to be a really hard sell to convince them otherwise. Yeah. I mean, well, that's the really hard part with price too. It's like, it's almost, I mean, when you're at scale, price is easy to go a little bit down on. It's easy to kind of like squeeze the competition and everything. I mean, how does it, so how does it work from a pricing perspective on your end? Like when you, you get seven items, could be cotton, could be polyester, could be kind of, kind of a surprise. You could score, you, it may just kind of be status quo, but like, how do you guys do that on the, on the financial side because i mean most people don't realize that like besides the luxury market like the clothing industry is wildly small margins like yes. tiny margins it is so crazy it's a volume game uh-huh. it is and their return rate is so high which is something we've dug into a lot lately is because i didn't realize that like some of these big box mainstream stores they're not reselling the items you return like 30 to 40 percent of returns are not being resold I'm like, what is that? I didn't know that was, I mean, and I'll, and I used to be guilty of, especially with swimsuits, like I'm going to go buy 15 swimsuits and try them all on and pick the two that look the best for me. And I didn't realize I'm returning that back. None of those are being resold. Like that's ridiculous. You know, that's crazy. Um, 
<laughs> Anyways, that was a tangent with returns. <laughs> yes. That's, that's, cr- well, and you think about like the, I don't know, the rate, even brand protecting their equity too, where, you know, like a Michael Kors, for example, they'll be like, oh, like we only need to have this many purses in circulation. We didn't sell that many, burn the rest, like for the brand equity. What is that? I know I've, I, um, uh, on my Instagram algorithm is like dumpster divers who, yes, they'll find like Michael Kors bags with like a knife through, through them. So someone can use it. It's like, it, it is, it is gotten way, way out of control. Everything has. Mm-hmm. Yes. But. Well, what about the whole slow movement? Like the idea of like made to order. I mean, is that, cause that's, it's not secondhand, but it, it's in the same mindset of like, Hey, let's, let's be thoughtful about this. That is, I mean, that is our, probably our biggest message that we try to communicate. I mean, on our homepage, we have a conscious consumer guide is just, I, I'm, I mean, we're not perfect. Me and Nicole are not, um, with our consumption, but we are like really intentional, which I think like, you know, if you're going to go buy a, you know, fast fashion item, but you know, you're going to use it a bunch, the cost per rare, or this is a really special, important event that I need to look a certain way for. And I don't have time to find something secondhand. Like, you know, there, I think there is a lot of room for improvement just with thinking it through a little bit, instead of just like running into target for, you know, bagels, and happening to buy like two t-shirts that you didn't need while you were in there. That just that behavior change alone can take people. And for my generation, it's a lot of the like swiping up on the phone in the middle of the night. We joke about that a lot. It's like, just don't unfollow. If you have somebody who is like constantly making you buy things off the internet that you don't need, unfollow them. Like, yeah, stop watching their stuff. Like, this is not good for your pocketbook and it's not good for the environment either like let's stop <laughs> stop doing it yeah I, th- I think that's a really interesting point too because that's kind of what we we try and talk about on goat in in any context of sustainability this idea that none of us are perfect individuals businesses communities none of it's perfect that's okay like accept it move on because too much of this industry is always like well if you're not perfect well then we don't belong to support you it's like you're not perfect the one pointing at me and it's like that it needs to be more of a of a mindset shift and that's why we kind of take intentionality circularity and community as kind of our pillars because it's kind of this idea if you're just a little bit more thoughtful about what you do you think circularly about it and the people that it's going to affect even that moment of pause it might lead to a better decision and if you do that at scale seven billion people well, might help i think that's why people don't do it is because it's so overwhelming and there's so much to it and whatever that they're not even like, it's like, I'm too busy to dip my toe in. I'm not even going to try because there's, it's yeah, a chasm of perfection and, and yeah, a busy mom is definitely not gonna, yes, (laughs) she doesn't have time to do that. But I really do think moms are the ones who are driving our society, you know, the quiet drivers of America here. And so I really do think they can make change happen. It just has to be approachable, simple, easy to digest and understand for them to be able to do it. And frictionless. I think that's because, I mean, it's the understanding that like, you know, if you have all these wonderful reusable towels and stuff that you use to clean up stuff but it's like oh no this one needs a paper towel it's like I'm gonna use a paper towel because it's handy and it's like that it's it's okay that's all right but just know that you have both and everything has a purpose to actually you know for the time and the place yes me and nicole have joked about paper plates because there was a time when we were like doing more of the influencing thing before this, this, we opened hand me up and she shared something on a paper plate and it, you know, a bunch of people gave her a hard time about it. And she, and I, she had just been in, in the hospital for her health. And she was like, look, this isn't something I normally do, but like, I've been really sick over here. <laughs> and like, I need to just be able to throw away plates. Like, I just need to be able to do that this week. And like, can I just have a little grace for that, please? Like we're, I need a convenience item this week. I'm sorry. And it, it is interesting how, I mean, I think we a lot of times feel like, oh, you know, 
yeah, the perfection, the like call to perfection, which we are definitely calling ourselves to, but it's like, it's going to take us time to get there. Like, at least we're trying, we're trying to get down the path and make a difference instead of just, yeah, looking at everybody else and saying what they're doing wrong. That's what we always tell a lot of people too. It's like, be a little bit more patient. Like there's a, we call it a patient urgency. It's this idea of like, you know, you got to do something, but like, know that especially the bigger bigger company it takes longer to do it smaller company there may be things that come up a lot of the companies i mean i i used to work in coffee like a long time ago and we would we would try and get all source all of our coffee from women owned, owned and operated coffee farms and which was so cool and then at the same time it's like okay can we go a step further and make sure that everything is organic and then could you go up even higher and regenerative organic yes. and it's like you Somewhere could along the way you're exhausted <laughs> Well, yes. and also these farms, they would grow things organically, but to get the organic certification, it was so much more money. And it was like, they would like to get there, but they have to pay for it. And so what we would do is we'd pay more for the coffee. So that way they could save up for the organic certification. And then you can keep going from there. And I think that people are too quick to go, well, what are they doing actually behind the scenes? And I think that when companies are a little bit more transparent about it, be like, yeah, we're trying here. Look, we're not perfect. Here's our mistakes. I think people are way more accepting of that than being like, we're perfect. And, and then kind of knowing in the back of their mind, like you're kind of not. Sure. Yes. Yes. I mean, we, so one huge problem we have had in our business is poly mailers. So like we send the clothes and poly mailers, which is just enough to eat Nicole's lunch. Like she, it is just driving her nuts and she can't, send it. And I'm like, you know, from a business perspective, I'm like, Nicole, we can't afford to spend this much money and still make money and still stay open and still run a business with non poly mailers. And we got a, well, then that's how we connected with you, but we got an award, a grant where they gave us money and we're like, we can do poly mailers now. So like, sometimes, you know, it's like when people are willing to come alongside you and help you, it's like, okay, now we can afford that. And now we can, you know, move that into our business model, which is really cool. Oh, uh, it's incredible. Cause I mean, you think about like, would you rather make the right decision right now and then probably not have a business sure. or <laughs> still make the right decision, but make sure you still have a business. And it's like that, that transition I think is really important. And a lot of that honestly comes down to price. Like I think that's one of the hardest parts is the sustainable replacement right now still is more expensive. And I, I think we've, we've kind of talked about this internally at Goat and it's this idea that like people I I truly believe that no single person looks around and goes, yeah, let's trash that. <laughs> like, let's destroy the earth. <laughs> like, nobody actually wants to do that. They just may not know the right way, but also price usually wins at the point where you go, this solution, that solution. I can only afford this one. I'm going to go with that one. It's just a lack of options. And it's it has to come down a little bit on the price side, which takes a little bit of technology time. And but at the same time, it takes a consumer saying, look, we need to transition and kind of coming alongside. Yeah, I. Yeah, it, it you don't want there is so much about the industry of sustainability that is like un, kind of untouchable. And what I do think is cool about secondhand is secondhand clothing specifically is it's become so trendy with the younger generation. And there is like this element of it that, that I, I think a lot of people do it, not because it's sustainable. Like they don't know that they're not, that's not right there. And so I think that has like really helped kind of align the two, so to speak, as time, as time has gone on, which has been cool to see. And we're, we're starting to get to where that generation is having babies, which we're excited about like that. That's so yeah. cool. Well, because that, that's the idea because I think it's its how do you make it just the seamless thing? I mean, we'll, I've worked a lot in the food and beverage industry too. And when you look at food and beverage, it's like, yeah, the label matters and the cost when it goes to the grocery store and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, the person is going to grab the thing that they just like. They're not necessarily going to go, oh, well, let's see where they source it from. Like, they're not going to do that in the grocery store. They're just going to grab it. That seamless, frictionless decision, it, it's on the business to actually 
make that as lower footprint as possible communicate it yes but there i mean there you have that whole opportunity of greenwashing and being like hey we just make the label green and everyone's like oh it must be better but but it is it is a little bit on the business to do the friction because you can't expect the consumer to do the research like i do the research because i'm interested in it (laughs) but i don't know i don't i don't want to put it in there but probably eight out of ten people they're not gonna go all the way down to the granular level read the privacy policy and read all the things no they're not especially a mom with a baby on her head and you know who just wants a, a good cup of coffee in the morning like she's not yeah she's not doing that you're right well and i i love the secondhand side of of just that it, it is regardless of sustainability it's popular mm-hmm. it's a and cool I think thing that, that's happening right now yeah yeah and i that was kind of their our challenge at goat when we first started is like we have these big problems in the world we're trying to solve it and it's like we could stand on a on a platform and say carbon we could stand on a platform and say evs and all those things one we don't know the truth of any of those first but secondly it's got to be fun it's got to be cool like make sustainability cool not a guilt thing it's just like nah, make this cool and let it work mm-hmm. yes yeah we we couldn't agree more we it has to be as easy and yes they have to be excited about what they get in their bag and and what clothing item you know that like you mentioned earlier that secret treasure like oh this is a really expensive dress i just got that that element definitely has to be there i mean the mix the mystery box idea is great like the idea of a mystery item it's always like ooh, nice especially when it's not for an adult woman (laughs) like it's for your kid like i I feel like people are they they seem to be happy with it yeah they're like oh this is great he loves this and i'm like oh good (laughs) So where are you guys looking to kind of take the business as as you guys start to grow? Because you said you guys had some bigger things that you wanted to tackle. Obviously, some of these take time. But where do you guys want to go with with it? I mean, the, the big dream, the big dream is to close our own loop. So right now we use partners for our offload clothes. We love to close our own loop. And I do think that technology is close um, for us being able to do that. But as of right now, it's not there and we can't solve that problem in this problem. So I try very hard to keep us focused, but, um, we'd love to, you know, close our own loop. We'd love to em- employ, you know, a, a marginalized mom group as we grow and, um, really provide an outlet for them to have a flexible job where they can be a good mom. Um, I think too, like just scaling that alone, is going to be hard for us. Like I mentioned earlier in the podcast is, you know, figuring out how we can sell to the more passive general consumer is going to be a huge problem for our business that we're really focused on. And, um, yeah, I mean, scaling just the hand touching of every item, it's not going to be a, it's not, it's going to be no joke for us as we, as we get bigger. So those are, those are kind of like the more short term problems. Um, and things that we're looking to tackle and really finding ways to use as much as possible that we get, um, reuse, redistribute, um, is really our main goal right now. That's huge. Well, and and I don't know, using every single thing you can, most people put that under, you know, sustainability, which technically yes, but It's also just good business. Waste is a cost. Like, that's what I think everybody forgets. Waste is an actual cost. Yeah, it is. Oh, it totally is. And I mean, our biggest cost as a business is shipping, which is, you know, a whole nother thing in and of itself. And so we've been very focused on trying to, you know, in our local community, solve the problem of too much kids clothes. And then how can we duplicate that as we scale instead of just scaling up here, you know, how can we scale in other places where they can solve those problems to cut down on the, you know, shipping, which is great for a business, but also great for the environment as well. So yeah, the shit, I, people forget the shipping side, like two day shipping, we all got used to, but it's It's the worst. (laughs) <laughs> it's crazy well and i also we we had a podcast earlier in season two and it was it was like 80 percent of the footprint of energy everything is in the last mile it's not the it's once it gets to that last distribution plant there to the home that's the crazy one there's a lot of things in the industry that can be changed but it's 
the, the idea of the locality in the in the local community though i love that concept because i don't know i think with a with a technology connected world very globally just i don't know the idea that i don't know 30 years ago the thought of sending somebody a message across the world right. via the inner like it wasn't a thing really right. Right. and now it's like normal to get something real time I think people also forget about their own community. And I think that's starting to kind of come back of like, hey, we kind of want that. We can go global, but also like, what about the people right across the street from us? Yeah. And it's obvious too, that like we joke about the coasts because that's where a lot of our orders are coming from now. Um, and because, and I really think it's because they are, the coasts are, are more aware of what's going on in the sustainability and conscious consuming and all of that, then we're in Texas. So we're right in the middle of the country. Then here in Texas, we can also like pop over to target pretty easy here. Whereas like in LA, they're not running in to target two times a week. Like the moms here are doing. Um, so yeah. So as we scale, we'd love to just get, get more out there in those locations to, to move inventory around yeah from a material standpoint where were you guys kind of looking to try and i mean because closing the loop is kind of something that i think everybody's it, big fashion houses are trying to do it h and is trying to do it all the, all of them are trying to close that loop but also what does that mean <laughs> like because for everybody like what is it what does it actually mean what is closing closing the loop for an energy company is totally different than closing the loop for our, for clothing companies so what does closed loop look like for you guys because you guys rely heavily on things coming in sure yeah so i mean we we allow our customers to send their clothes to us so that is you know one way we're doing it a lot of we're you know we see the clothes we send out come back a lot and that is happening so that's one whole problem right is just being an outlet for a safe place to send things where you know it's going to be used well um and then there's that kind of what we can afford right now here in the middle is sewing um, we found people who like take kids clothes as dead stock and can, you know, use it moms who can are seamstress and can use it to make their, you know, little pouches that they sell and things like that. Um, which was when we started, not something we really thought of like this fabric, like there may be a stain on the front of the shirt, but the back of the shirt is a great, a great piece of cotton fabric that they can use for something. So that's kind of where we are now as closing our own loop. And then ultimately, I mean, Nicole's really the, the dreamer about this and the one who has researched it the most, but ultimately we'd love to be able to actually go textile to textile recycling. So break down textiles and then make another textile. And that would ultimately mean launching our own line of clothing. Um, but, and it would be, oh, I mean, she gets so excited when she when she talks about it, which she's much more um, creative minded. Like, I know she's excited about the idea of designing clothes, too, um, out of the fabrics, I guess, so to speak. And, and we have so many ideas, too, about like how to because we're touching so many clothes, like what are the clothing items that are lasting multiple sizes? Like there's a lot of like really cool things that can be done with just like pieces that transition all seasons and more than you know more than one kid size and how we can design for that there's not a lot of people doing doing that in the industry right now so we'll see that is there's not a lot there's not a lot of that happening now anyways though textile to textile and so much of kids clothes is polyester that it's just it's it'll that'll be a long road i think yeah in terms of and and you may not know the answer to this but i'm just curious what's kind of do you think the percentage of clothing waste like children versus adult because i i don't know you go into like a target and it's kind of like you got adult clothing and then it's like the kids clothing second is huge and it's like is that is that waste like i don't know if that waste is like you know is that proportion proportional to what ends up in landfills like 70 percent children's clothing and 30 percent adult i don't know and i was one always wondering about is that it's so much smaller so like yeah. yeah you can get a lot more shirts 
for a in pound a smaller than you can <laughs> for like a one adult shirt. I don't know. We haven't seen. I mean, there's a lot of stats around just like specifically the secondhand market, kid versus women. I mean, kids and women are the two biggest secondhand um, markets. Women is actually bigger than kids right now still, which is not super surprising to me. Um, but, but no, I don't know specifically how much is going to the landfill, like from a kid's clothing perspective. And I don't know that that's be like, it's such just a trash pile. I don't know that anybody is tracking that. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Do you, are there any pieces that like, do you guys remember the first one you shipped out? Oh yeah. Yeah. We did. We did 10, what we called beta bags to like just people who followed us on the internet and we did it off of our kids clothes. So like we just used our kids secondhand clothes. We're like, we have a two T girl bag. Does anybody want it? And then they, they get, and it's, it is so funny because our new employee um, that we have in Nicole, like they remember, oh, I sent that girl a pair of shorts that said, I love Cali. And I'm like, how do you remember that? Like, and, and I mean, we track a lot um, of what we're sending and what they like and don't like and things like that. So we can get smarter with the customers as they come back and whatever. But yes, I mean, it is funny. Like, I'm like, oh, that bag. I remember her. She you know, <laughs> can remember what we send. Do you, is there like a one piece that, I don't know, has, has like come back four or five times and it's just like, a legendary one that keeps going or do you just kind of <laughs> you have, we do I will, and what's interesting too is like a lot of companies use the same fabric so we'll have like just a ton of just a certain fabric in all different sizes and dresses and shirts and different things and yeah i mean our our new employee is really into vintage clothes and she keeps finding like like true vintage pieces which we don't really have the the market to sell i mean our consumers aren't interested in that so it's it's been a problem we've been trying to solve is like how do we get these vintage pieces into the people's hands who actually care about vintage clothing? want the vintage yeah. yeah 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 i mean given fast fashion the the vintage clothing was made better oh yes <laughs> it was actually it's obvious it was, yeah yeah i would imagine you guys get to like I mean, you, you feel it, you see it. I mean, it's probably the way it hangs, the way it washes, the way it does everything. Yes. And, and yeah, the tags are different. It is very cool. A lot of, we've been getting lately, I don't know why, a lot of Levi's vintage. And yeah, it's like more like true denim than like, than what you're seeing now is not really denim. Yeah. What's been your favorite part of what you've been working on? Like what's, what's been in the thing for you? Cause there's so much obviously that goes in and so much work and love that goes in. It's kind of been your favorite part. And I mean, I really, me personally, I just really have a heart for moms. And so it has been just super fun to see people like change how they're thinking and love what they're getting and, you know, just solving that problem for moms and even more so moms who wouldn't normally be interested in something like that. This that's, that's where I like would love to see the needle move. And I think it's fun. Um, you know, when someone comments on Instagram, it's like, what? I didn't know that was you know, I didn't know that returns weren't resold. Like, I'm like, oh, good. I'm glad, you know, that's been exciting to kind of see that evolve. And I've educated myself as I've gone along, which is, has been super fun. Um, and then, of course, just like running the whole thing with my best friend is like a total blast. Like, we're just having so much fun solving the problems together and hanging out and packing orders. And it, it's it's been a really good time. That's awesome. It's all, it's all, honestly all about keeping it fun. Like that's, that's kind of number one, like the work life. I mean, it's always, it's always a challenge. There's always fires. There's always things you have to do, but like, if you keep it fun, it makes it a little bit better. It does. It does. And it's what will give you like the emotional fuel to handle the hard stuff. <laughs> well, and where, so everywhere in the world, where's your favorite place to enjoy nature? Oh gosh. The beach, hundred percent. The beach. Last summer, um, we took our kids to Costa Rica for a month, and it was like the coolest thing ever. 
Um, but yeah, I'm like, if I can get away to the beach, that is where I will be. Toes in the sand. <laughs> there, the, honestly, there is something about it. It is so it's nice. Crazy. It is. Yeah. yeah. It was always like whenever, um, cause I was lucky enough to grow up next to the water and you, there's like that sound of the ocean, right? That like, it's got that deep sound to it. No sound machine can repl- replicate it. Like there's something about it where you're like, toes in the sand you're like this is great it is um, it's the best where did you grow up uh santa cruz california so a little bit northern i was very very lucky seriously I, I every single day it's like a little bit of a pinch of like wow and i didn't really realize it till i i moved away from it that because you know home is always home and then you know you just won every person for some reason knew santa cruz and i was like really my my little town <laughs> and then you're like wow actually this is like a pretty and this is a special incredible place um and that's really what fueled a lot of what i do at goat it's kind of like this you know there it's a beautiful place of nature and and a lot of the places i've traveled there's there's all like i've lived in arizona i've lived in colorado i've lived in a lot of different places that weren't coastal and every single one of those places have beautiful things about them You could be middle of the desert, no ocean, no trees, nothing. And there's something absolutely stunningly beautiful about it. And it was like this realization that, well, damn, we got to, we got to make sure this stays like this. Um, However, we need to do that. Um, Let's do that. And that's, that's kind of been the the reminder. And that's why I always ask people, you know, where's your favorite place to enjoy nature? Because it's always that anchor point to be like, all right, cool. This is, this is why. Um, It's not just, just to to feel good. Oh, it's on the list. They're so good at it there. I mean, they're so good at what you're talking about there. Like, they just genuinely respect it. And they're, they're so good at, like, like, they don't make any decisions that aren't good for, like, keeping their environment safe and their animals and their nature safe. It's so cool. And to the point where they will be inconvenienced. Like, they're making huge sacrifices to, to maintain that. Oh, that's huge. Well, and and also I think a lot of this comes down to just simplicity. Like I, I think that we overcome, we make everything way too complex for what we need it to be. And I, I, what I love about sometimes when I just go out in nature, it's like the best is like, you have no phone service. You're, j- you're just like there. Yes. You realize <laughs> like it's life is not, not as complicated as it, as we make it out to be. <laughs> But then you like come back to society and you're like, oh my goodness. It floods in quick, doesn't it? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, how do you find that balance between the two? And I just think if if everybody takes a little bit more time to just pause and and enjoy either the moment or a nice breeze outside or like whatever, just pause for a sec and then don't take out the phone. Just just like hang for a sec, see what happens. And I I think that that's kind of always been the reminder. What we try and remind people at GOAT is like, it's not... You don't have to make sweeping changes. You don't have to sell your car and buy an EV. You don't have to do like all these crazy things that like most of the industry tells you to do. It's like, no, no, no. Just just pause for a sec. Yeah, go walk in the happens. grass in your front yard. Yeah. Yeah, literally. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. True. I love it. Well, well, this was so much fun. Yes, Kara, thank you so much for just sharing the hand me up story. We'll have links to everything in the bio and everything. Um, but it's yeah, truly incredible what you guys are doing. And honestly, an area that I would have never put on my radar, like just honestly, like children's clothing would not have been on my radar. But like after after going deeper on it, I was like, oh, my God, this is this is so incredibly important, though, because kid, kids are born, kids grow up, kids go through clothes like it is a never ending cycle of customers a huge impact can be made on that because we don't know if you know who knows what the infrastructure of cars will look like in the future who knows about that there will still be kids that need clothes sure (laughs) it'll always be a thing so thank you for just doing what you do oh thank you thank you this has been so much fun and we love sharing the story and it, it we're excited about the future so thank you thank you so much for listening to the goat podcast You are the reason why we exist and why we show up every single day. You know, I've spent too many years being against stuff and I've found now that it's a little bit easier and a little bit more fun to be for something. How are we gonna power the world? How are we gonna build the world? How are we gonna feed the world? Company isn't just 
good or bad, black or white. Usually there's a lot more there, a lot more that they don't know. It's actually about what you do in your daily life every day can make a huge difference. Give this episode a share, join our GOAT community, but most importantly, go spend some time in nature because you might find it a meaningful reminder of the amazing place that we get to call home. I'm Steve Cassinham, and we'll see you next time.